Good morning, family of God. It's good to be back with you today. I just want to thank you for tuning in and looking at our video here. I hope that the uh, word that comes forth is really, really um, something that would build you up, would encourage you, would instruct you, would inspire you. So uh, I just want to say thank you for all those who have written into us and have told us how much they appreciate these broadcasts. Thank you for those of you who are supporting us. We really appreciate you. And thank you to the people who uh, normally show up in person at Shoreline Full Gospel Fellowship. Uh, those that can't be there this week, uh, this video is provided for you so that you can participate as if you were there. And we hope to see you back very, very soon. So um, my name is Tom Loud. I am pastor of Shoreline Full Gospel Fellowship in Seattle, Washington. And before we begin, let's just start out with prayer. Heavenly Father, Thank you for all that you are doing, all that you have done. Lord, we put all of our trust in you, all of our confidence is in you, and we know that you sit on the throne, Lord, and uh, nothing has slipped past your notice, Lord. Uh, the world sometimes seems like it's going berserk, it's going in many different directions, but you, Lord, are still on the throne and you have the final say. So we put all of our trust in you, we depend upon you, we look to you for our guidance, and we thank you, Father, for what you're doing. You're doing great things today in our lives and in this earth. And so we just give this time to you. And we ask that you would open up our hearts and our minds to be able to hear your word, to receive your word, to let your word be planted, to let your word root and bring forth much fruit. In Jesus' name, we praise you. Amen. So before we continue on, let's uh, turn it over to Brother Aaron Baker for a little time of praise and worship. Amen. Well, good morning. This is the day that the Lord hath made. Let us rejoice and let us be glad. Let us also pray before we praise his holy name. So Father, we thank you for this day. We honor you as we come together and join our hearts as one. And we ask you, Lord, to take your living word and divide it. Divide that word of truth and just dispense it into our hearts, Lord, with the wisdom of the day. In Jesus' mighty name, amen. You give life, you are love, you bring light to the darkness, you give hope, you restore every heart. Light to the darkness you give. 
get our lungs. So we pour out our praise. We pour out our praise. It's your breath in our lungs. So we pour out your praise to you all. Uh, yes. Thank you, Jesus. Welcome back. The title of this morning's message is Transition. Now, think about the word transition for a moment. Transition is a noun. A noun describes a person, place, or thing. A transition is a thing, but the whole feeling of this word transition really feels more like an action than a thing. Transition feels more like a verb than a noun. A verb describes an action, and the word transition screams of action. It screams of movement. We can see within the word transition another word, the word transit. Transit is also a noun. Transit describes something that is used for the carrying about of people, goods, materials from one place to another. Transition is a word that the Lord is speaking to his people today. At this very hour, we are going through a transition. We are in a place of transition. You are on a path of transition. Now, everybody say with me, transition. Get that word in your head because the Lord wants you to continually see yourself as being in this place and being aware of what's going on around you because this transition is very, very important. It's what we do in this transition that makes all the difference with the outcome. This word is very important in our lives at this time. This is a word that is uh, something that describes a change. It describes something that is in a process of change. The children of Israel were promised deliverance from the slavery of Egypt in the Old Testament. They were promised a homeland of their own, and it was not in Egypt, but a land on the other side of the Red Sea. When the Lord raised up Moses to carry God's people to the promised land. Before they could officially declare that they had actually left Egypt, they would have to cross a body of water called the Red Sea. The Red Sea divided their land of slavery from their land of promise. Now we can get a little picture of the history of what happened in that time by uh, listening to the words of Joshua in Joshua 24, five through seven. He says this, a little recap of the history of leaving Egypt. Then I sent Moses and Aaron, and I afflicted the Egyptians by what I did there. The Lord is speaking. And afterwards, I brought you out. When I brought your fathers out of Egypt, and you reached the Red Sea, the Egyptians pursued them with chariots and with horsemen as far as the Red Sea. So your fathers cried out to the Lord, and he put darkness between you and the Egyptians, over whom he brought to the sea and engulfed them. Your very eyes saw what I did to the Egyptians. Then you lived in the wilderness for a long time. So Joshua is recounting by the Spirit of the Lord, he's recounting what happened, is the Lord raised up a man named Moses. And Moses stood up against Pharaoh, and Moses eventually led the people to the Red Sea out of slavery. But when they got to the Red Sea, there was a body of water in the way. There was an obstacle in the way. And for them to get fully out of the land of Egypt, they had to cross that sea somehow. So the Lord opened up the sea and they went across as on dry land. But when the Egyptians decided to follow them, the sea closed up on them. And the Lord said, you will see those enemies no more forever. So that's what God did. Joshua is recounting that to the people. Egypt was the land of slavery. The Red Sea was basically their prison wall. As long as they were on this side of the Red Sea, they were still in prison. If they could just get across that Red Sea, they would be free from the reach of their oppressors. Oh, what a day that would be for those people because they had been praying for 400 years for God to release them from the land of slavery. It's not unlike what happened to the black slaves in the United States. After the emancipation 
a proclamation was signed by Abraham Lincoln. The slaves were declared free. But you know what? They were declared free, but there were still some issues that lay ahead for them. They didn't just get to walk out of their slavery and walk into a nice new house and government provision for all their needs. They walked into a place that was a time of transition, a time between slavery and the time between prosperity. There's a transition time there. There's a time you have to go through before you get to the promised land. One day they were slaves and the next day they were free. One day they were praying with their whole heart for freedom and the next day God granted their requests. And here's a text from the Emancipation Proclamation signed by Abraham Lincoln, January 1st, 1873. That on the first day of January, in the year of our Lord, 1863, all persons held as slaves within any state or designated part of a state, the people whereof shall then be in rebellion against the United States, shall be then thenceforth and forever free. And the executive government of the United States, including the military and the naval authority thereof, will recognize and maintain the freedom of such persons and will do no act or acts to repress such persons or any of them in any efforts they make for their actual freedom. So the Emancipation Proclamation said, not only are the slaves free on this day, January 1st, 1873, but the government will back up their freedom and protect them with their military. Now, can you imagine the news of the Emancipation Proclamation being signed to the slaves? Can you imagine how that news affected those slaves? I mean, it would be like your ancestors have been praying for this for many years. In fact, in the slaves case, it was 90 years of slavery in the United States. Can you imagine what it was like for the children to hear that we have just been made free people? Well, I imagine that's kind of what it was like for the children of Israel. They got set free from their captive slavery after 400 years of praying, 400 years in captivity. Not a single person alive had ever known what it was like not to be a slave. Well, you would think there'd be times of jubilation right after that, right after they're declared free, there'd be big parties, big parties and everybody's having a great time. But that's not exactly what comes next after the freedom. When the slaves in the United States were emancipated, they found that they were cast into a place of uncertainty. They no longer had a home. They were cast off of the plantation. They had no job. They could not return to the land of their ancestors. They had no possessions. They had no food. They had no transportation. They left slavery and entered into a temporary place with no idea what the future held. The children of Israel found themselves in a similar situation. Once they had crossed the Red Sea, they threw a party, but it didn't last for very long. It they celebrated and they sang a new song. Here's the new song they sang. It's found in Exodus chapter 15, verse one. I will sing to the Lord for he is highly exalted. The horse and rider has been thrown into the sea. The Lord is my strength and my song. He's become my salvation. He is my God and I will praise him, my father's God and I will exalt him. Great party, fantastic party. So after they're crossing the Red Sea, three days later, the grumbling starts. Yeah, the party was there the day after, but three days later, the grumbling starts. They came to a place called Mirabah. And at Mirabah, that was their first uh, place that they could come to that had a spring where they could drink water. Now, these people had been three days without any water except what they were carrying. So they needed to have water. They came to Mirabah, but there was a problem there. The, the spring at Mirabah was fouled. The water in it was undrinkable. And this caused them to be very, very upset. They began to realize being set free meant you were no longer guaranteed food and shelter or water or anything else. You were on your own. You were free to start providing for yourself. Like the slaves that are emancipated in the United States, these people did not leave bondage and step into the promised land, but they found themselves in a place of transition, in a land of transition. It was the place between the slavery and the promised land. There's a place of transition. For them, it's called the desert. Egypt did not abut the promised land. It wasn't right next to it. But after they left Egypt, there was a big stretch of desert. And this is the place of transition, the place between the two places they had been or were going. So after Egypt, they entered the desert. But the desert was not supposed to be their final home. It was a land that they needed to travel through to reach their final home. After slavery doesn't come riches, and security, but after slavery comes the beginning of the transition. 
This place of transition is the road you are walking on that leads you from the place you used to live to the place you want to live, but it still needs to be traveled. Now, it isn't what you do in the land of slavery that gets you to the promised land. It's what you do in the land of transition, in the place of transition that gets you to the promised land. If you've just left Egypt and now you've entered the desert, if you don't keep walking, you're going to stay in the desert the rest of your life. You need to make some decisions. You need to say, it's time to begin our journey. Let's not forget that the promised land was a homeland that was promised to every Hebrew slave in Egypt. All of them had the same promise. But once the Hebrews left the land of bondage in Egypt, it was what they did in the land of transition, the wilderness, the desert, that determined whether they would actually ever reach the promised land. We are all in a time of transition right now. We all have promises that lay ahead for us that God has given to us. And if we will keep traveling through this land of transition in the right direction with the right attitude, we will find that we can enter the promised land, the things that God has promised for us. But you have to be willing to go through the time of transition and do it with the right attitude. In the land of transition, you begin to realize that though you are free, you are helpless without God's help. You realize that though the oppressor is no longer oppressing you, you have needs that must be met or you will not survive and you have to lean on God to provide you with those things. You realize that you find yourself in a place that is not your final destination and the journey will require provisions that you just don't see available or accessible and you're going to need some help. And in that time of transition, you need to fully depend upon God to get you through it. In the land of transition, you begin to recognize that to obtain the promise, you will have to depend on God's strength, on God's provision, on God's direction, or you may never actually get to the promised land. In the wilderness, we face our vulnerability. In the land of transition, we face our vulnerability. We face the fact that without God, we cannot do it. We cannot make it. In the wilderness, the strength of our faith is put to its ultimate test. In the wilderness, this place of transition, we discover that what we are made of and what our limitations actually are. The wilderness, the time of transition, the place of transition. This is the furnace where the iron is forged and shaped into the thing that the master desires. It's in the wilderness of transition that things are not easy, but the promise keeps us moving forward towards the prize because we have a promise. That's what motivates us to keep going. Faith in the one who gave the promise is the thing that will keep you putting one step in front of another without ever giving up. To stop moving forward means the death of the promise. To go back to where you came from means slavery and oppression, and it is on this road in the place of transition, the desert place, that your true character is developed and then it is revealed. Let's not forget that when the children of Israel left Egypt, they were completely untrained in the art of warfare. None of them knew how to fight a battle or use a weapon or lead an army. They had been slaves for 400 years. If they had gone immediately from Egypt into Canaan land, the promised land, they would not have been ready to face their enemies because they never knew how to fight. It was in the wilderness, in the place of transition, that they strengthened themselves to do very hard things that they had never done before. It's in the wilderness of transition where people were sifted. You divided the weak from the strong. It was there that it was decided who would actually get to make it to the promised land and who would not be able to make it to the promised land. And it was all determined based on their behavior in the place of transition between the land of slavery and the promised land. It's how they behaved in this time of transition in the wilderness. After traveling through the wilderness for a long time, the place and the time of transition, eventually the children of Israel reached the threshold, the borderline of where they could cross over into the promised land. But once again, there was another wall there that needed to be crossed. It was called the River Jordan. The place where you cross over from the transition place actually into the promised land. In Egypt, the wall had been the Red Sea. But now they have come up to the final border that divides them from the land of transition and the land of promise. One final boundary to cross and they would be home. They would be walking in the promised land. That boundary once again was the River Jordan. And as they stood on one side, they could see the promise on the other side. But they weren't there yet. They had to get across that river. Some had encouraged Aaron to make a golden calf when they first left the land of Egypt and to worship that. And you know what? 300 men were struck dead that very day for doing that. They all had the same promise, the promise of the promised land, but those 300 never made it to the promised land. 
The sons of Korah rebelled against the leadership of Moses. They elevated themselves as holy priests who are worthy of offering burnt sacrifices who the Lord did not call. Well, as the people of Korah rebelled against Moses, the earth opened up and swallowed nearly all those people. And then a fire came down and burnt up the other 250 that had remained. They all had the same promise, but they never made it to the promised land. Some of the people out in the wilderness complained that God wasn't providing enough food, the kind of food that they wanted. They complained about having manna every day. They wanted meat. And as they complained about that, God sent quails. And those people ate until they had gorged themselves, and many of them died. They died in the wilderness. They died in the place of transition. They never made it to the land of promise. The promise had been theirs, but they never made it. Moses disobeyed God at one point, and he struck the rock that gave forth water after God had told him only to speak to the rock. Moses disobeyed God, and though he had the promise, he never made it to the promised land. All of these people had the same promise, but only those who went through the transition time in the promised land with the right heart attitude, with their hearts surrendered to the Lord and following God and believing in faith, only those people actually were able to cross into the promised land. So now after this long journey through the land of transition, the desert, they reach the Jordan. And some of the people who started remain, but some never ever made it to that river. And they see the promised land across the river. They see it, it's in their view. Their leader Joshua chose 12 men amongst them, one from each tribe to go and spy out the land, the promised land, and to come back and give a report so that they could make a strategic plan for attack. When the 12 returned, to make their report, they all said it was an abundant land, a land that flowed with milk and honey. But 10 of those 12 said, but the people are giants and we cannot battle against them and win. They brought back what the Lord says was an evil report. The land was promised. This was D-Day, the final step over the final boundary that divided them from the place of transition to the place of promise. But 10 of them said the opposition on the other side is too hard for us. We can't go across. We can't do this. God was displeased with that. Now, all the people that had heard this evil report, they had a response. It's found in Numbers chapter 14, verses 1 through 4. This is what it says. Then the whole congregation lifted up their voices, and they cried out. That night, the people wept. All the Israelites grumbled against Moses and Aaron. And the whole congregation said to them, if we had only died in the land of Egypt, or if we'd only died in this wilderness, why is the Lord bringing us to this land to fall by the sword? Our wives and children will become plunder. Would it not be better for us to go back to Egypt? So they said to one another, let's appoint a leader and let's return to Egypt. They chickened out. They didn't believe what the Lord had promised. They didn't believe in the Lord's sufficiency to give them victory in battle. So they decided they would go back to slavery. That's never the right answer. Then Joshua and Caleb, the two spies that had the good report that says, we can do this. They're the two spies that did not say it was too hard, but said, the Lord is on our side. We can do this. These two men stood up and said, don't listen to this. We can overcome them. We have God on our side. We have more than enough. And this was the people's response to them. Numbers 14, 10. But the whole congregation threatened to stone Joshua and Caleb. They threatened to stone these two men, which were the only two men that were speaking in faith. And the Lord's response to the people was this. Numbers 14, 11 through 12. And the Lord said to Moses, how long will this people treat me with contempt? How long will they refuse to believe in me? Despite all the signs I've performed among them, I will strike them with a plague and destroy them. And I will make you into a nation greater and mightier than they. So Moses he went on behalf of the people to the Lord. He reasoned with the Lord. He interceded with the Lord for these knuckleheads. And he asked the Lord to pardon them. And this was the Lord's response. Numbers 14, 20 through 24. I have pardoned them as you requested. The Lord replied, yet as surely as I live and as surely as the whole earth is filled with the glory of the Lord, not one of the men who have seen my glory and the signs I performed in Egypt and in the wilderness yet have tested me and disobeyed these 10 times, not one will ever see the land that I swore to give their fathers. Not one of those who have treated me with contempt will see it. But because my servant Caleb has a different spirit and has followed me wholeheartedly, I will bring him into the land he has entered and his descendants will inherit it. Now let's drop down to verses 26 through 32 in Numbers 14. 
Then the Lord said to Moses and Aaron, How long will this wicked congregation grumble against me? I have heard their complaints that the Israelites are making against me. So tell them, as surely as I live, declares the Lord, I will do to you exactly as I heard you say. Your bodies will fall in this wilderness. All who were numbered in the census, every one 20 years of age and older, because you have grumbled against me, surely none of you will enter the land which I swore to settle you in, except Caleb, the son of Jephunneh, and Joshua, the son of Nun. But I will bring your children, whom you said would become plunder, into the land you have rejected, and they will enjoy it. As for you, however, your bodies will fall in the wilderness. They hadn't reached the promised land. They all had the same promise. It is what they did in the place of transition between the slavery and the promise. It's what they did that determined their ultimate destiny. It determined whether they ever got to enter the promised land. It's what you're doing right now. It's the faith you're having and the faithfulness you're having right now that's going to count for you to be able to enter into all the things God has promised you. So do you know what happened next after the Lord had spoken this this curse basically over them saying you're all going to die here in the wilderness you know what happened they got afraid and they repented and you know what happens when people repent they get let off the hook not exactly repentance occurred once they had heard the lord's judgment against them for not obeying his voice to cross over and to take the promised land they decided after hearing what the lord said they changed their minds they decided they were now ready uh never mind lord never mind we'll go across and they decided to do what they had refused to do earlier. But you know what? There's a timing. When God says jump, he wants you to jump at that time, not a week later. They had missed their timing. They had missed by saying no to the Lord when he said go. They had missed it. Numbers 14, 40 through 45. Early the next morning, they got up and went up towards the ridge of the hill country. We have indeed sinned, they said, but we will go to the place the Lord has promised. He's already told them, you will never go there. But once again, they're not believing his word. Moses understood what was going on and he warned them. But Moses said, why are you transgressing the commandment of the Lord? This will not succeed. Do not go up lest you be struck down by your enemies because the Lord is not among you. For there are Amalekites and Canaanites that will face you and you will fall by the sword because you have turned away from the Lord. He will not be with you. But they dared to go up to the ridge of the hill of country, though neither Moses nor the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord moved from the camp. Then the Amalekites and Canaanites who lived in that part of the hill country came down, attacked them, routed them all the way to Hormah. They tried to change their mind, but the Lord had already made his decree. He had already told them, it's too late. You should have acted when I told you. He said he pardoned them, but that didn't mean they got the reward for doing the right thing. They were pardoned from the sin. The decisions that you make in the desert of transition are the decisions that determine your ultimate destiny, whether you ever make it to this thing that the Lord has promised for your life, to the plan he has promised for your life. The consequences of some sins you can't take back or erase. You can be forgiven, but the consequences to some sins remain even when you're forgiven. If you murder somebody, the Lord can forgive you for that. Doesn't mean you won't go to prison though you may still have to pay the consequences. If you get some uh, person, young lady pregnant, well, the Lord can forgive you, but you know what? It doesn't mean you won't have to pay child support for a very long time. If you cheat somebody out of money, you know what? You can be forgiven, but it doesn't mean the court will not demand that you pay restitution. There are consequences to our choices, even when there's forgiveness. It is the choice that you make in this place of transition between the land of slavery and the land of promise that determines the reward you receive, that determines whether you fulfill everything God has planned for your life. And it will determine whether you get to enjoy the things that have been promised to you or not. When you come to the edge of your promised land, you're right before it. Can you say that you have maintained the faith, you've maintained a thankful heart during the transition, during the wilderness, that you've maintained the right attitude, you've maintained your faith? Can you say that you kept your eyes on the Lord's ability to get you there and not fastened your eyes on the obstacles or the enemy's abilities? Can you say that you maintained your faith throughout the whole wilderness experience all the way until you finally were able to cross the final obstacle? Right now in our country, we're in a time of transition. We are in an in-between place, a place from shifting from one leadership to another leadership. So what's our attitude in this time of transition? Is our eye on the prize, on the good things that God has promised? Are you complaining against the Lord for not doing things the way you would have had them done? 
The Lord pardoned every one of those people who rebelled against him, who didn't have faith, who didn't respect the leaders he put over them. And he didn't return them to their prior state of slavery, but they still died in the wilderness, never receiving the promise. You have been set free from slavery when you got saved. When you received Christ, you were set free from slavery, but you haven't yet crossed over into the place of all the fulfilled promises that God has made for your life. There are promises God has given you. Some are in his word, some have come to you prophetically, and he wants you to be able to make it to the promises, to the fulfillment of the promises. But it all depends on what you do in the time of transition, in the land between slavery and the promise. Look at your life right now. You're in a place of transition. Are you complaining? Stop complaining. It talks about those in the wilderness who murmured against the Lord, and it says they were destroyed of the dest destroyer. Stop complaining. Are you attacking those who c were called to lead you or saying, it's your fault, I followed you? Don't do that. Trust that God has put people in charge that he wants in charge, and that if you will just be obedient to God, then you will see that God will bring forth the promise. Or are you being drawn to worship idols by putting other things as more important in your life than serving God? You put your job in front of God. You put your family in front of God. You need to reorder your life, put God first, not make an idol out of anything else because your idols will fall. They will fail. Are you doubting God's ability to fulfill his great promises in your life because the enemy seems too big and the opposition is too great? It's not too late to change that attitude. It's not too late to say, Lord, I believe. It's not too late to become a faithful servant of God who trusts in God and who has the right attitude. It's not too late to become yielded and obedient to the Lord. It's not too late to have courageous faith in the Lord and in the promises he has given you, but it's really all up to you and you're the one who chooses and the choice you make will determine whether you make it from the wilderness into the promised land. So the promises of God are sure. The promises of God are there. But there's many Christians who die never reaching the potential God had planned for their lives, never reaching the promises God had given for their lives. It's not God's fault. It's what we do in the time of transition. That's what determines whether we make it or not. We've got to go through the time of transition, through the wilderness, with the right attitude, with the right heart, with the right faith, and with an attitude of obedience and love for the Lord. So you're in a time of transition right now. You know what? Check out your heart. Check out your reactions to things going on around you. Check out your opinion towards people around you. Check out the things that you look at and see is too great to overcome. Check out the things that you look at and they cause you to fear. Check all those things out and then say, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. Let me bring it all back to where it should be. The Lord is my help. The Lord is my strength. The Lord is my provider. I shall not be moved. I will trust in him all the days of my life. He will provide for me in the time of transition in the wilderness. He will take me to the promised land and I will cross it. And when he says go, I will go no matter how big the opposition looks because the Lord is on my side. That's the kind of faith that the Lord rewards. And those are the people that receive the promises of God. I hope this has inspired you and encouraged you. And I pray God's best blessing on your life. In Jesus' name, amen. I'll turn it over to my wife for a time of prayer. Amen. Hello, good morning, and thank you for spending your Sunday morning with us. I just wanted to give you a little word of encouragement as we close in prayer. Um, I'm wearing one of my favorite shirts. It says, be period loved or beloved. And then my friend Joanna had given me this uh, pendant and it says, be strong. And that was her encouraging me when I was going through my uh, difficult trial with cancer. So I wanted to give us something positive in the new year to think about. And I was reviewing 1 Corinthians 2.9 in the Amplified Bible. And that's the one that talks about eye has not seen nor ear heard what God has prepared for those who love him. And so I'm going to read it to you and let it soak into your spirit like it did to mine and really encourage you about the goodness of God and the future he has for you and I. By the way, Henry is off this week and this is his older sister, Mochi. So Mochi's sharing with us today. 1 Corinthians 2, 9, the Amplified Bible says, what eye has not seen and ear has not heard and has not entered into the heart of man, all that God has prepared, made and keeps ready for those who love him. 
that is for those who hold him in affectionate reverence, promptly obeying him and gratefully recognizing the benefits he has bestowed. Amen. We cannot even consider with our natural mind all the good things that God has prepared for us. In Jeremiah 29, 11, we know it says that his plans for us are good. He has a good plan for us and a hope and an expected end. So saints of God, I know we've been on this marathon race for a long time now with COVID and with all the restrictions and the election and all the different things going on in our world today. Don't lose heart. Don't faint. Don't be weary in well-doing, but keep on and know that God has prepared something so wonderful for us and he's made it and he keeps it ready for all of those who love him and who hold him in affectionate reverence. All right, Father, in Jesus' name, thank you for these people that are participating today. I pray that your hand of favor be upon them and their families. I pray salvation and life over their families. Father, I pray life over each and every person that you would just cause, Lord, a revival and a renewal to take place in their walk so that they are reinvigorated and rejoicing for all the good things that you've already done, Lord, all the good things you have done and how you've brought us through the dark valleys of life and you'll continue to be with us even unto the end of the world. In Jesus' name, Lord, cause us all to grow and not allow the darker things to bring us down, but to make us better. And we look forward, Father. We look forward to tasting and seeing the goodness of God in our lives this day. In Jesus' name, thank you, Lord. Amen. Have a good rest of your weekend. Tell someone you love them this weekend. Amen.